This is the first lecture for week 10 covering osmotic regulation and excretion. When we talk about excretion, we're talking about the function of the excretory system, also called the urinary system or the renal system. So really focusing on the kidneys, their function, and how they take material out of the body. The second lecture will be on reproduction, and I'll post that in the next few days. Um, over the past several weeks, uh, we've been covering different organismal systems. So we started out kind of scaling it up with tissue initially and cell types, kind of looking at basic structure and function. Then we scaled up to organ systems and individual organs. And then over the next few weeks after reproduction, we'll be talking in lecture more about information flow. So getting really deep into DNA, thinking about um, how information flows through DNA and through cells, then we'll scale up into populations and entire ecosystems. Um, so the scope of what we cover in lecture is going to be a little bit different uh, uh, moving forward from what we cover in lab. You'll still be revisiting some of those organ systems we've already talked about, but some of those uh, standard or student learning outcomes that the university or the sorry the college has for you um, really focus on you understanding those like bigger scale processes. So we want to make sure we cover that before the end of the semester. Um, we're going to be covering and touching base on a lot of information we've uh, touched on before. So I know sometimes I start the slides with like a review of past weeks, and I'll do that to some extent, but I'll also throw in some material throughout the slides um, and in a little bit less structured way uh, that you've already come into contact with. We are covering the sections a little bit out of order just because I think it makes a little bit more logical sense to do it this way. We'll start out by talking about what we mean by osmoregulation, what exactly is being regulated through this process. We'll think about what nitrogenous wastes are, so what is actually removed from our body uh, through the functioning of kidneys. We'll think about how other um, organisms, other animals, do the process of excretion, then scale up to our excretory system, um, and then think about how that excretory system is hormonally regulated. So we'll end with that ADH case study that um, I introduced uh, in the endocrine lecture that you covered in the homeostasis lab, and we'll revisit it again today. So I wanted to first start by having you kind of think about this statement. And when we talk about challenge statements, it's something that you might agree with or disagree with. Um, it, there might be a right answer, there might not be a right answer, but you're gonna end up kind of talking th about this and addressing it in your reflection for this week. So I wanted to kind of plant this idea in your head. Um, do you agree or disagree that urine is made from blood? So that might sound crazy, it might make logical sense to you, it could be somewhere in between, um, but I want you to be thinking today throughout this lecture about that statement, um, what we might mean from it, and the distinctions between urine and blood. So if we think about what urine actually is, um, it ranges a lot in volume, anywhere from 750 to 2,000 mils per day, so up to two liters per day. There's a really wide range of pH. Um, we'll talk about what we mean by osmolarity, kind of like solute concentration, which also really varies, uh, often depending on the um, concentration or the um, volume of the of the fluid. Um, there is something called urobilinogen, white blood cells, uh, to a very small extent. Protein uh, is usually not present. Bilirubin, nitrate, nitrites should not be there. Nitrates are normal. Um, blood should not be, whole blood, like red blood cells, should, should not be in your urine. Glucose should not be present, but there are lots of things like ions, amino acids, vitamins, metabolic waste products that are normal components of blood. So Urine shares a lot of stuff with blood, but there's also some key differences. Uh, oftentimes when we think about red blood cells, that's, that's what we think about when we think about blood um, and things like proteins. So we'll kind of unpack this and think about the things that are missing as well as the stuff that's present. Think about the functional structures of the kidneys when we get to those and how that all relates together. Um, so before we get much further, I wanted to focus on that idea of 
osmolarity or milliosmolarity, milliosmoles. Um, so starting to kind of think about how we might quantify or measure urine. So you might remember from chemistry uh, that moles are a special chemical unit based on uh, a, a molecules, uh, molecular mass and um, something called Avogadro's number, but it, you don't need to stress about that. It just means a special chemical unit. So uh, there's a molarity is a measurement where we take a, the number of moles per unit volume measured in liters. And then molality sounds kind of similar to that, but it's the moles per unit mass of solvent. Um, so the unit that we use there is kilograms. Uh, for water, it has an equal relationship of liters and kilograms, so those are kind of interchangeable. Um, but for other substances, for other solvents, it's different. So on the previous slide, when you saw solute concentration measured as milliosmoles per kilogram, um, it's kind of pointing to this idea of molality, but we'll unpack what that milliosmoles means. So oftentimes when we're thinking about solutes in our body fluids, they have a charge. Um, remember last week we talked quite a lot about the nervous system um, and we saw all those charged uh, ions, so things like sodium and uh, chloride and potassium and calcium, all of those are very important and they all have charges. Um, so when we look at an ion, we have to not only take its presence into account, we also have to take the charge of that individual ion into account when we're studying that body fluid. So we might use a measurement called milliequivalents per liter, which means that we take the number of millimoles because these are kind of tiny amounts of stuff. It's not like a thick solution. Um, so we take the milli millimoles of, of, the, of the ion that we're talking about, so for example sodium, and we multiply it by the number of electrical charges on an individual ion. So sodium is Na+, plus. it just has one posit positive charge, so we just multiply it by one. Calcium, on the other hand, is still just one ion, but it has a double positive charge, it's two plus. So here we would multiply sodium by the millimoles of sodium by one, but we would multiply the millimoles of calcium by two. So we're just thinking about those relative charges when we're figuring out kind of the um, solute concentration within body fluids, whether it's interstitial fluid or plasma or anything like that. We also can use milliosmoles, uh, which are the milliequivalents of solute per kilogram of solvent. So again, switching kind of between millimolar and millimolal, um, and the body fluids uh, that I mentioned, stuff like interstitial fluid and blood plasma, usually range from about 280 to 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. So I wanted to introduce you to that because um, when you read textbooks, you're gonna see measurements like that. You might, uh, in a clinical setting, collect measurements like that. Um, so I want you to be prepared for that and understand what it's talking about and where they get those numbers from. But for lecture, I will never have you memorize those values or do any calculations with them. I just want to teach you the language so that you're familiar with it. So when we are studying urine, we're doing something called urinalysis, and this is a very important diagnostic tool. Um, if you've ever had different types of infections or gone in for a pregnancy test or any sort of thing, um, urinalysis is very common. And uh, the first way that we can kind of start to study urine is the relative volume um, in one kind of voiding session. So how much is the patient producing? Are they producing what we would expect? Back, like a normal volume, are they producing too much urine, not enough urine? Um, and we can also look at the color. So you kind of maybe have an innate knowledge that the lighter the urine, the more hydrated the individual is. Uh, darker urine is often signs of dehydration, but there are a lot of medications and a lot of other factors that affect the color of your urine. Um, so your analysis is kind of tricky because there's kind of a base range, but it's influenced a lot by your diet, um, your metabolism, any medication you're taking, different environmental factors, but we still can collect some evidence and figure out diagnostically what medical conditions might exist. So if we look at this quick case study, 
there's a lot of numbers here, but I'm going to draw your attention to a few things. The first column is what's being tested. The middle column is this patient's results. And the right column is the reference range. So what we would expect in a maybe normal healthy adult. Um, so here it says clarity, turbid for the patient, which means that it's cloudy, um, which uh, is usually not what you would expect. Um, it also is positive for two things called leukocyte esterase and nitrite. Remember that nitrite is usually not present in urine. We saw that a couple slides ago. Nitrate is present in urine. So nitrate is uh, one nitrogen and three oxygens. Nitrite is one nitrogen and two oxygens. And uh, that shift from nitrate to nitrite is called reduction, and it's typical of some bacteria, so the function of some bacteria. Um, and so if we have nitrite present in the urine, that often indicates that there's a bacterial infection of the urinary tract. And indeed, we see here through the microscopy um, that there's a lot of white blood cells present. Remember, white blood cells are involved in the immune system. Uh, so if there's a ton of them in the urine, there's probably an issue there. And we also see that there's lots of bacteria in this urine sample. So this would be a urinalysis that's typical of a urinary tract infection um, if we're trying to diagnose it. So we're gonna spend the rest of the lecture focusing on how that urine is formed, how we actually get to that point, um, some of the biological demands associated with urine, why we have it at all, um, and the structures and function of our urinary tract. So just a few reminders. Remember, our cells are selectively or semi-permeable. So they don't always just let stuff through. There's some stuff that we think about as always being able to pass through cells, like water or certain ions. We're like, yeah, those can get across the cells. But I want you to kind of start thinking about this idea that that selective uh, permeability might actually limit the flow of water. So there's going to be some types of cells, some types of tissue that don't allow water through. Um, and don't allow super small ions through either. They will have to cross through their own channels. Um, so this selective um, or semi-permeability is sometimes a lot stricter than we give it credit for. Remember that osmosis means water diffusing along its own concentration gradient. So from where there's a lot of water relatively to where there's not as much water. In other words, it moves from where there's not many solutes to where there's a lot of solutes because water likes to dilute things. And remember that animal cells are very sensitive to changes in tonicity. Um, and really, any cell that doesn't have a cell wall as a supportive structure uh, is really sensitive to these changes in tonicity because it doesn't have anything to support it if it starts swelling up. Um, so. These are examples of red blood cells being put into different solutions. If a red blood cell is placed into a hypertonic solution, water is going to leave the red blood cell in order to dilute that hypertonic solution. If red blood cells are placed in isotonic solutions, water is going to leave and enter equally. And if it's placed in a hypotonic solution, water is going to flood into the cell and keep entering the cell until it swells and bursts because the water is trying to dilute that internal environment of the cell. So keep that image especially in mind. Okay, so um, also thinking back to week eight a couple weeks ago when I asked you to really go over that endocrine lecture in preparation for homeostasis, I talked about this case in which a woman actually died from hyponatremia and water intoxication after she drank two gallons of water and wasn't able to use the bathroom. So she did this as part of a radio contest. She said that she was having extreme pain and an intense headache. And we link that to the kind of function of our kidneys and what happens when you don't urinate. So remember, water is flowing in, the balloon expands, and um, that leads to uh, fluid being way too dilute. So water flows into the body, body cells from that interstitial fluid, um, which is pictured in the top right, kind of in a diagram similar to the red blood cells. Um, and so in addition to the problem of cells 
bursting. That's why we don't inject patients with drips uh, that are just pure water. We put saline drips that have a tonicity um, that makes sense for our cells. Uh, if we have swelling and we don't have bursting because it's constrained within a brain case, our, our, um, our skull, uh, then our brain is pressing against that skull and it can lead to really serious symptoms, including death, as we saw in this case. So urine is really, really important because it helps our bodies maintain homeostasis through something called osmoregulation. So organisms rely on osmoregulation, this idea of maintaining salt or more broadly solute concentrations and water balance, so osmotic balance across membranes within our body's fluids. Um, so this picture is showing a marine iguana. Um, and so uh, you see this a lot with uh, marine animals like iguanas and sea turtles and uh, seabirds like seagulls. They have uh, a salt around their nasal areas. They have these salt glands that kind of pack the salt together and then they like, blow it out of their nose. Um, so you see that around uh, those types of organisms. Um, so that's how they get rid of salt in their bodies in addition to their excretory systems. Um, you might be aware of the, of the idea that birds uh, don't have um, separate urine and feces. They have a cloaca that releases everything at once. They do have separate digestive and excretory systems, uh, but their ureters, which are structures that we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, connect directly to their digestive system. So it's like they have the separate systems, but then they reconnect at the intestines and everything comes out together. So again, more bird facts. Okay, so when we're thinking about some of those solutes that need to be kept in balance, um, we distinguish between electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Electrolytes are able to be dissolved in water into ions. So some common ones include sodium, magnesium, phosphate or phosphorus, um, potassium, calcium, as well as chloride. So when we talk about those ions, we're talking about electrolytes. Non-electrolytes don't dissolve into ions, so these include common blood proteins like albumin or globulins um, or hemoglobin. Um, so this one that's pictured here is human serum albumin. Um, albumin is also commonly used in a lot of clinical settings. Um, so for a lot of molecular tests and diagnostics, albumin either from humans or from cows, bovine serum of albumin are really important. But when something is in our body fluid and it doesn't dissolve into ions, it's a non-electrolyte. So we're thinking about kind of the balances of those things, of the electrolytes and non-electrolytes. And another thing that we really have to consider are structural units that contain nitrogen. So remember, amino acids are building blocks for protein. They have a central carbon, a hydrogen, a carboxy carboxylic acid group, an amino group, and an R group that's really unique. Um, that amino group is super important, and it has a nitrogen. Nucleotides, which are the building blocks of nucleic acids like DNA and RNA, also have a big nitrogenous base that has a double ring structure that has nitrogen, it has an NH2 sticking out the side, so they have a lot of nitrogen. So these key macromolecules have tons of nitrogen in them, and they get filtered into different metabolic processes. Remember, catabolism breaks apart molecules, um, so we have all these catabolic metabolic processes that are breaking down amino acids and nucleotides and using them for generating energy and building cell structures and we get a lot of waste products that contain nitrogen. So when we're talking about nitrogenous waste we're talking about those waste products from metabolism that include nitrogen but are also usually quite toxic. So we don't want them sitting around in our body, we don't want them building up, we want to get rid of them. And the first and most toxic of these is ammonia, which is usually converted to urea through something called the urea cycle, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There's also uric acid, which we use, um, but we don't want to rely on too much. It's not 
as to it's not by any means as toxic as ammonia it's not as toxic as urea can be um, but it can be dangerous if it gets too high in concentration which we'll talk about in just a moment so again ammonia is extremely toxic we want to convert it very quickly to urea and that's done in the liver using the uric cycle um, so when we have protein catabolism or protein breakdown uh, that produces ammonia, which is then um, in the mitochondria and other structures of the liver um, converted into urea through this series of steps. You do not need to memorize this. Um, I just wanted to get you familiar with this idea of cycling to get rid of these waste products. And you can measure the amount of urea in your blood um, with this measurement, blood urea nitrogen, which you might see clinically. Um, so this is the concentration of urea in the blood and it's used as an indicator of how well your kidneys are functioning and your general health. So I mentioned that if you have too much uric acid, that can be really bad and you might be familiar with this condition called gout. It's incredibly painful. It's considered a type of arthritis. Um, and it's also related to diet. So if you watched or read Game of Thrones um, or Song of Ice and Fire, uh, the Prince of Dorne, Duran Martell, is pictured as being in a wheelchair. Um, and the reason for that is because he has gout. And a lot of people are kind of upset with him because he's just, you know, sitting in his kingdom um, and off by himself, not really involved with a lot of stuff uh, in the show, at least. Um, and, you know, his, a lot of people are suffering and he's just kind of uh, got this rich man's disease. Um, so it's associated with eating a lot of meat, which sometimes people don't have access to. Um, but it's also related to genetics and medical problems and other metabolic factors. Um, this painting on the bottom is kind of an artist's representation of how painful the condition was for him. So symptoms include that really acute arthritis. You can actually visually see the redness and swelling. Um, it might also cause fever, fatigue, bone erosion, as well as kidney stones, which are real painful. So I wanted to start us by uh, when we're thinking about excretion systems, I wanted to start us thinking about kind of smaller organisms and scale up. Um, so seeing how this plays out on a single cell level and then scaling up accordingly. So you might remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the immune system and what causes disease, we talked about, param uh, I don't know if we talked about paramecium specifically, but we talked about protists, which are single celled kind of animal-like creatures. Um, some of them have cilia, which is what's pictured here, those little kind of hair-like structures all around them. Um, and a lot, a lot of them are aquatic. Um, and so paramecium is an example of this, and it lives in fresh water. So if we're looking at it, we can kind of see all those solutes inside of the single cell and a lot less solutes outside of its environment. So uh, would we consider the paramecium hypotonic or hypertonic relative to the environment? Hopefully you thought about that. I'm not just pausing for no reason, um, but remember hyper means a lot of, um, and so uh, we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, think about what, uh, which one you think it is, and then do you think water surrounding the paramecium will enter or exit the cell? Um, so hopefully you understand that the paramecium is hypertonic relative to its environment. It has a lot more solutes inside than the environment has outside. So the paramecium is hypertonic. The water is hypotonic. So water is going to rush into the cell. But fortunately, um, let me see if I can kind of highlight these. We have these guys right here which are called contractile vacuoles. So I'll show you a, a moving image on the next slide of those. Um, so paramecium has a ton of stuff inside its cells. You can see that quite clearly on the left image um, and it's just packed with solutes relative to the external environment. And it has these sun-like structures which are called contractile vacuoles. So in the GIF on the right, you can see the, par or, yeah, the paramecium taking on water in that contractile vacuole, and it's going to swell up and then push it all out. 
So this is kind of like uh, if you're on a boat and it gets a leak, you would bail out water. You would be taking on water, but you're also kind of pushing it out with a bucket. Um, this contractile va vacuole is basically the bucket for this paramecium. It's constantly taking on water, but the paramecium is able to pump it out with that contractile vacuole. If it didn't, it would continue to take on water and eventually swell and burst and explode. So this is a very simple example of a single organelle, a single vacuole that's involved in excretion. Um, I'm not sure if this will play, uh, so I'm gonna introduce it before I click. Um, if it doesn't play in this lecture, I strongly encourage you to look at this video in the PowerPoint that you can download, not the PDF, um, because it's so cool. Paramecium are really cute, and these ones are just like swimming around with their cilia, eating yeast uh, that have been stained with a dye called Congo Red. Congo Red is a pH indicator, so it changes uh, from red when it's neutral or basic to blue when it's acidic. So you can actually see um, the paramecium have these little food vacuoles that are basically like our stomach that have acid in them, and they're able to break down the yeast inside of them, but you can see it change blue as they do that. So uh, here's hoping this works. Nope, it didn't. So um, you should definitely, the recording system for PowerPoint is really helpful, but it doesn't always uh, work super nicely with videos. So you should definitely look at that on the PowerPoint because paramecium are so cute. Okay, so then um, in other organisms like flatworms, we have different excretory systems, things like flame cells, um, those are pictured in the bottom left, and those work with cilia and with a tubal system to push waste out of the flatworm and draw water in. Um, in uh, different insects, such as bees, as well as crickets and grasshoppers, you have what are called malpighian tubules. Um, those help really get rid of a lot of metabolic waste without wasting any water. So they produce a really thick paste as the urine. So um, they hang on to as much water as possible. Okay, so getting into human systems, um, I know that you've already kind of talked about this in lab with homeostasis, and hopefully you got a chance to look at the kidneys when you dissected the fetal pig. Um, but when we're thinking about what makes up the urinary system, so the excretory system in humans, there are two kidneys in most people. Um, you get maximum filtration efficiency with two functioning kidneys, but there's a lot of people who are just born with one or who have to kind of function with just one. Um, so blood is filtered and urine is produced at those two kidneys, which are along your back. That's why when, uh, if you're watching something like MMA and you get a kidney shot, it's on the back. Um, and then they are connected to two tubes called ureters. So each kidney is connected to a ureter. Those are just tubes that take the urine uh, into the bladder. And then the bladder stores the urine until it's ready to be released from the body through the urethra. So the kidneys are gonna be very important for fulfilling that functional filtration role. When we talk about nephrons, which you've already kind of talked about and which we discussed when we talked about um, the endocrine system, um, we'll talk about, we'll focus on the kidneys specifically. So when we're talking about the urinary bladder, I think it's worth mentioning that it's very flexible. It ranges in size from about zero mils to 600 mils, so over half a liter um, in, in adults. Obviously, it's quite different if you have a very tiny human. Um, it's mostly made of muscle, but it also has this interesting structure called transitional epithelium, which looks very columnar when the kidney, or sorry, when the uh, bladder is empty, but as the bladder fills with urine, it's going to stretch out and appear squamous. So this epithelium goes from being very tall and narrow to being very short and flat and spread out to accommodate that kind of stretching of the urinary bladder. Um, the muscle that makes up the, the bladder is also really strong initially, but weakens over time, which kind of leads to incontinence in a lot of older adults. I also wanted to talk briefly about the urethra, um, specifically because we're going to be talking about the reproductive system next. 
The urethra is basically just a tube that transports urine from the bladder to the outside of the body, um, but it looks quite different in people with vulva versus people with penises. Um, so if you have vulva, uh, the bladder um, has a much shorter urethra attached to it, and it's very separate from the reproductive system. If you have a penis, it all kind of uh, collects together, and so semen and urine exit through the same structure, the urethra. Um, and so the difference in relative structure is also why urinary tract infections are a lot more common in people with vulva um, and why it's very important. Uh, you should know this as just as people and also as people who are going to be working with a lot of patients, um, that it's super important for people to pee after sex. And especially if you have, um, if you have a vagina, uh, you have a much shorter urethra. And so it's really important to clear it out of bacteria. Um, that's a major portal of entry. And a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people are misinformed about stuff like that. So as people who are going to be doing a lot of sexual education for your patients and communicating about different things like that, you should know that and you should pass that information on to your patients. Another thing that you might encounter in your career in healthcare is kidney transplants. And I actually didn't know this until a few years ago. Um, when you have a kidney transplant, it's not actually transplanted. Uh, the diseased kidneys or the non-functional kidneys usually stay there. It's just they add another kidney onto it. So we'll talk about kind of all the blood vessels that we're referencing here, um, but the kidneys in your body stay in place and then another transplanted kidney is added and hooked up to particular blood vessels to filter blood. Um, a urethra, a transplanted, uh, sorry, ureter is added that connects to the bladder and then it all goes out to the bladder and the urethra. So the third kidney is just added, nothing is taken out. Okay, so when we're looking inside of the kidney, we can start to see different zones. There's the renal cortex, which is along the outer edge. Um, if you kind of uh, longitudinally cut the kidney and open it up like a book, the cortex is along the outer edge and the medulla is in the center. And then the nephron, which we'll review in just a moment, um, is going to be mostly in the cortex, but then a big part of it, the loop of Henle, is going to dip down into the medulla. So some other uh, structures of the kidney that are important to note are the renal columns. Um, let me draw them right here so we can see them here. Um, these guys separating out uh, different internal kidney structures, including the renal pyramids like these guys. So the renal columns provide separation and support. The renal pyramids are where the bulk of the, um, the loop of Henle in the nephron is located. And then the renal papillae are bundles of collecting ducts that transport urine out. So you can see those right here. And you'll also note that all of these tubes come together right here um, in the structure called the renal hilum. So that's where all the blood vessels, let me redo that line, blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels, the ureters, the renal pelvis, all connect together in the kidney. Um, and you can actually see it here on this uh, autopsy image. Um, and the renal hilum, specifically the renal artery and vein, connect to the aorta and the vena cava, respectively. So they connect to major vessels attached to the heart. So they're super important for filtration of blood. Okay, so the role of the kidneys, the way that um, that filtration and osmoregulation occurs is through filtering blood. Remember, our interstitial fluid um, gets kind of transported into our lymphatic system, which eventually drains into our circulatory system. So everything makes its way into our circulatory system eventually. Um, and so that blood flow out of the aorta, a big part of it is going to branch off onto the renal artery and unfiltered blood is going to flow away from the heart into the renal artery towards the kidneys. Arteries move blood away from the heart to body tissue, including the kidneys.
So blood enters the kidneys through the renal artery. Um, it's not just like a major artery going in and then splashing all over the kidneys. It gets smaller and smaller. And you can see that branching occurring here. So we have um, efferent arterioles. We have um, the smaller structures, those arterioles coming in. Um, we have glomeruli, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and something called peritubular capillaries. Um, so peri means next to or adjacent to, tubular is a tube, um, and capillaries are capillaries. So these are small blood vessels for exchange that are kind of wrapped around and adjacent to um, the bulk of the structure of the nephron, not necessarily at Bowman's capsule. So I'm just putting these terms out there because you've already seen them in the endocrine lecture and in the homeostasis lab, so they should be somewhat familiar to you, even though we haven't talked about them in this particular lecture. After filtration occurs, um, all the blood that's left in vessels uh, in the capillaries is going to exit the kidneys through the renal vein. And then everything that is actually urine, so formed urine, is going to exit the kidneys through the ureters. And so all of this is really kind of clustering at that renal hilum right there, um, but it's all you know different vessels and different flows and pathways. So when um, we have those peritubular capillaries, we have arterioles, we have all those different things near the nephron, um, there's a ton of surface area. And the nephrons are really the functional unit of the kidney. They're where that action is taking place. And the kidney is just a ton of nephrons packed together for the most part um, in terms of its actual function. And something that's kind of cool is humans have anywhere from 200,000 to 2.5 million or more nephrons. So we just have tons of them, about 1 million on average. And that number is very flexible. So depending on your demand, you might change the number of nephrons. For example, um, immediately after someone gets pregnant, uh, they start increasing the number of nephrons that are packed into their kidneys. So you um, have more blood flow, you have more individual nephrons to accommodate that. Um, and so you have a lot higher urine production right away before you even really have a fully formed fetus um, pressing against your bladder. Okay, so getting into the individual structures of the nephron and how the uh, circulatory system really brings blood in to be filtered, that happens at this structure called the renal corpuscle, which is uh, actually two different structures. It's the glomerulus, which is that little bundle of capillaries that is bringing blood in and maximizing surface area for exchange. That's where that first step of filtration is really occurring. So anything that makes its way out of the glomerulus is then able to kind of cross through here and go into the Bowman's capsule, which is a protective sac that wraps around the glomerulus for filtration. So things like water, glucose, salt, amino acids, and urea are able to pass freely into Bowman's capsule. Um, that doesn't mean that they're gonna end up in the urine, they are just small and so they can make it across. But big things like cells or platelets or large proteins can't. So if you have proteins in your urine, it usually indicates that you have a problem with your glomerulus or Bowman's capsule. It indicates nephron damage. Um, and then uh, any material that actually makes it into this point is called filtrate. So we're not technically calling it blood anymore. It is definitely material that was in our blood moments before, but now it's called filtrate but it's not quite urine yet. So I wanted, before uh, I show you some of the names for these structures, I wanted to kind of walk you through this process of filtration and start visualizing it. Um, so we have this filtrate, and as it's moving through the nephron, you can see that there's less and less solutes um, that are making their way all the way to the collecting duct. So we have material coming in through the renal artery, filtering across, and you see that it's the smaller stuff that actually makes it into the Bowman's capsule. It's not those large things that left through the renal vein. These are gonna start moving their way through, but some of them are disappearing because they're actually getting reabsorbed into the body at different points of this nephron. So you can see the big stuff floats away through the renal vein, just one more time, going through Bowman's capsule, 
going through the proximal convoluted art, um, tubule, the descending arm, the ascending arm, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Okay, so when we're thinking about what those structures actually are, um, so up here, let me see what color I want to do. Um, this is the cortex right here. This is the medulla down here. And so this is kind of translating right here and right here. So most of the nephron, um, the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, most of that uh, is uh, located in the cortex. And then the loop of Henle and the collecting ducts travel through the medulla. So as blood flows in through the renal artery, remember the small material is going to pass through and the big material is going to leave through the renal vein. Um, and so now we have a lot of stuff in there still in that filtrate that we don't want to lose. We want to hang on to it. Um, and so things like nutrients, um, different electrolytes, different protons, we want to pump back into our body and reabsorb. So some of that is going to be active, some of it is just going to passively flow. When we're going through this descending limb of the loop of Henle, water is going to really easily cross. So that uh, descending arm is actually only permeable to water. So we're going to get a ton of water leaving and going out into this salty environment out here. Um, and so the reason that this environment is very salty is because by the time you get to about here, you have very concentrated urine, very concentrated filtrate. And there's a ton of NaCl in here. Um, so it's going to have a concentration gradient and it's going to flow out here um, because it's very concentrated. And then that creates you know, salt out here that draws water out of this point. So these kind of parts are going to help each other. Um, this uh, ascending limb is not permeable to water. So this area is not permeable to water. Um, so water can't cross, just salts, um, which are first uh, passively, then actively pumped out. So we're reabsorbing sodium and chloride, which are very important for cell signaling and for action potentials. Um, then we're, the filtrate's moving up into the distal tubule. Um, and so there's going to be a material pumped back out. It's our kind of last chance to reabsorb stuff like bicarbonate and potassium ions and water. So um, we're going to reclaim them there. And then the material is going to flow into the collecting duct where we get a, some salt back. And then we're able to grab a lot of water through aquaporins. Um, when I first introduced this, I think that I told you some tips for remembering the names. Um, proximal convoluted tubule just means close twisty tube. Distal convoluted tubule just means distant twisty tube. Um, so there's a lot of terms here that sound a lot more challenging than they are. Don't panic when you see them. Just take a moment, think about what the structure looks like and what it's doing, um, and then take a moment to remember. The collecting ducts are the last kind of duct or passageway where we can collect water. Um, and then everything else is going to be collected as urine. So this is um, an image for when I draw this on the whiteboard. Um, and so you can see that material that leaves the collecting duct goes on to the ureter and then on to the bladder. So I mentioned those aquaporins. Aqua means water, porin is opening or a Oh, uh, like a pore or a channel. So these are water channels, water openings. They can actually be popped into the cell membranes of the cells lining the collecting ducts. So if you have a signal that means we want to reabsorb more water, um, then we're going to uh, pop some of those aquaporins into the membranes and get a lot more water back. So uh, kidneys have this unique microscopic structure that contributes to their primary functions of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, um, but they also have a lot of secondary functions. So they can secrete a lot of hormones, uh, 
they are involved in blood pressure regulation. So they produce the hormone renin, which we'll talk about in just a moment, that raises blood pressure. Um, they also produce erythropoietin or EPO, which you might have heard of uh, involved in like doping scandals because it increases red blood cell production. Um, and then they also are involved in calcium absorption and the activation of vitamin D. So thinking about some of the hormones they're involved with, um, so you, we talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system last week. Sympathetic is that fight or flight or freeze, um, and parasympathetic is kind of calming down, rest and digest. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine are two uh, kind of hormones, kind of neurotransmitters that are really associated with that fight or flight or freeze sympathetic response. So things like your pupils dilating, your heart rate increasing, um, not really being able to uh, digest your food very well, having very dry mouth, not producing a lot of salivary enzymes um, or saliva. Um, and so these also constrict blood flow to the nephron, which means that we're not filtering blood as much and producing as much urine, and they temporarily suppress kidney function as well as signaling the RAS system, which we'll talk about next. Um, so there's a lot of hormonal regulation of the kidneys in addition to the kidneys themselves producing hormones. So that RAS system, the renin angiotensin autosterone system, is something um, I think pretty sure I've introduced to you guys before. Uh, it increases blood volume and pressure um, by changing how we have reabsorb material in the kidneys. Um, so angiotensin is produced in the liver, renin from the kidneys, which I just mentioned, converts it, um, another uh, enzyme called ACE converts it further, and then that changes flow of blood um, and ultimately increases blood pressure and blood volume. So if we have something like renin or ACE or angiotensin functioning the way it's supposed to, we have higher blood pressure and higher blood volume, maybe lower urine volume, um, so we have more stuff kind of staying in our body. Just to kind of visualize where all that is coming from, components of this like ADH are being produced in the brain. Um, there's some other stuff coming from the kidneys and the liver. It acts on the kidneys themselves um, in the, uh, the collecting ducts. So there's kind of a complex physiological relationship here. So if you've ever heard of ACE inhibitors before, uh, you definitely will at some point in your career. These are really common blood pressure medications, and these act on that renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, so they stop that ACE enzyme, which converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and stops that pathway. And so blood volume and blood pressure are then not increased. And so ACE inhibitors stop this mechanism that increases blood volume and pressure. And in doing so, they keep a stable blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, so I also wanted to review that ADH case study very briefly. Remember those aquaporins are water openings that can be added or removed, and that's regulated using a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. Um, which looks like this. Anti means against. Diuretic is something that makes you urinate, so it increases the volume of your urine and makes you have to pee more. And hormone is a chemical signaling molecule. So antidiuretic hormone is a signaling molecule that makes you not have to pee. So the more ADH you have, the more aquaporins, the more water is being reabsorbed back in your body and less of it is shuttling out through your ureters and your bladder. So when ADH is working correctly, um, osmoreceptor cells in the hypothalamus detect when your concentration of solutes in your blood serum is too high and they send a signal to another part of your brain. That part of your brain releases ADH, which binds to your nephron at the collecting duct, uh, near the collecting duct, and um, more aquaporins are then inserted into those membranes at the collecting duct. That means water is getting reabsorbed into your body, urine is more concentrated, and blood serum is more dilute, um, and then it stops that signal because it's a negative feedback loop. 
But in the case study from lab, I was asking you why drinking caffeine or alcohol actually increases the volume of your urine. So caffeine is a diuretic, which actually decreases the production of ADH. And in doing so, you don't have the signal to add aquaporins. You decrease the number of aquaporins in the collecting ducts. Um, and so that means that less water is reabsorbed in those areas and more water is shuttling through and leaving as urine. So ultimately, you have to pee more as a result of drinking anything with caffeine or having alcohol. All right, so that was um, the first lecture for this week. I will post reproduction pretty soon. Um, please make sure you look over the quiz feedback. Uh, listen to the lectures, please. They provide a lot of clues, so hopefully you're keeping that in mind. Um, check the study guide when it's posted. Please email me if you have any questions. I know a lot of you kind of wait until last minute to take the quiz, but you can email me. I will be by my computer if you have any questions or concerns about that, um, and make sure you're completing the quizzes between Mondays and Wednesdays.